In this video, we're going to start discussing chapter number four, Rock Yield and Failure. Before we get started into writing equations, let's try to see some extremely important preliminary concepts which are going to help us understand when to apply those equa equations. First, it's very important to consider what is the microstructure of geologic materials. In the subsurface, we can find from uncemented sand to well-cemented rock, varying quite a bit in its internal properties and the internal arrangement of uh, grains and cementation. And that internal property is going to govern how the rock fails in tension, in shear, or in compression. For example, it's not the same failure in an uncemented sand, like for example happens through a grain rotation and grain rolling over each other, like for example as it happens if you were to do sandboarding in a sand dune, opposite to the failure that will happen in a cemented sandstone or in a baggy carbonate. For example, in a cemented sandstone, mostly you will have failure in between the grains, at the grain cements, if those cements are uh, weaker than the matrix, or you may have failure through the grains themselves, if the grains are weaker than the cement. That's going to depend on uh, which one is weaker and which one is stronger. But Probably you can see right away that the failure difference between an uncemented sand and an, un and an uncemented sandstone is, is quite different. And also how the rock fails and what its re resistance is, is going to be uh, very different in those two cases. Let's see the last example in this figure. Here we have a buggy carbonate. Opposite to a grain cemented sandstone, a baggy carbonate is mostly a matrix with uh, pores that may be connected or disconnected. But the matrix is what is mostly connected and it's not made by specific grains like as may, it may occur in a sandstone. So failure in these cases is going to happen preferentially through the matrix of the rock connecting singularities in stresses that mostly occur in the proximity of pores and small fractures uh, within the rock itself. Okay, so microstructure again is very important and is going to govern how the rock fails, either in tension, in shear or in compression. It's also extremely important to consider what is the length scale of the problem and the process zone size in order to apply different theories and also to understand how rock fails. In petroleum engineering and energy engineering, uh, we have different type of processes that affect different sizes or my uh, load the rock at different length scales and also time scales. Let's start with the examples of length scale. It's not the same to fail a rock at the centimeter scale or less than an inch when we are cutting the rock with a drilling bit in which we're going to mostly fail the matrix of, of the rock than if we are applying a failure around the wellbore, which is going to affect a larger size of the rock. For example, going into the wellbore, if we find some imperfections in the rock, because as you go in larger size, it's more likely that you're going to find heterogeneities and discontinuities, it's not the same failing a rock at a very small scale, less than a one cent less than one centimeter than if you were to fail it at several centimeters or the scale of a meter or larger. 
and probably the difference is not going to be that much between these two examples, but we can go at much higher scales. For example, in the process of hydraulic fracturing, the process of injecting a fluid, it might fail the reservoir in shear and also in tension at a much larger scale. We cannot think of the rock in these conditions as just one continuous piece of rock or one continuous piece of rock matrix. In this case, we need to take into account these continuities such as uh, natural fractures or interfaces on the rock that at the scale of several hundred meters is going to be more likely uh, to find. And we can go even one step further and consider also failure in terms of mile-long processes. For example, in the depletion of the reservoir, depending on the size of the reservoir, we can cause compaction of the rock over several meters in thickness in the reservoir and in horizontal direction over se several miles. So you can see that failing uh, rocks or causing irrecoverable deformations in rocks and fractures is going to depend a lot on what is the size of the loading and what part of the rock we engage into that loading. It could be very small as in the case of cutting rock at the drilling bit or it could be very large as we go into a problem of depletion. I have one example also to show over here that hopefully is uh, uh, going to, to be remembered uh, when the, after you see this uh, video. Here, for example, you see an example of a rock climber uh, climbing a baggy carbonate. Usually carbonates are very good rocks to climb because uh, they are very strong and they also have uh, pockets or holes in which you can put your hands and you can climb uh, very nicely. And uh, some carbonates are actually very, very strong, like dolomite rock or also some limestone. It's, uh, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly hard and, again, uh, good to climb. However, also carbonates at the larger scale not a small scale, but a larger scale, they, they present fractures and they weather over time. Here, uh, you see an example of the collapse of a cliff uh, near Austin in, the, in what is called uh, Rice, Rymer's Ranch. Uh, this is a place where many rock climbers uh, usually go to climb. And unfortunately, when this happened, uh, nobody was, was harmed. But what I want to, to emphasize in this case is that the natural discontinuities and fractures of this carbonate cliff made the cliff collapse under its own weight and also because of a weathering, of course. But the rock itself, although it can be quite strong at a very small scale, at a very small size, when you take larger and larger pieces of rock, you start to find fractures, you start to find joints, you start to find uh, heterogeneities that make the rock to be uh, weaker. And that's something that we need to understand very well because when we apply our equations of geomechanics of failure, again, they are going to depend into the size of the process on and also on the length of the time of the loading. And let me come back to this. Not only length is going to be important, but also time. It's not going to be the same to fail a rock in a very short time than to fail it over a long time. Usually over a long time, like for example, with reservoir depletion, the rocks are going to appear to be weaker because the film is going to rock internally in very small amounts as time passes by. If you add to that 
phenomenon of, for example, uh, weathering or chemical attack that could occur also in the subsurface, the strength of the rock is going to decrease when you have those processes and when you fail them over a longer and longer time. You may remember also the example of the salt diapir, that it's basically a salt rock failing over thousands of years continuously. All right, what uh, we're going to see in this uh, chapter are mainly three types of failure. Uh, these are tension, shear, and compression. They are all important and we'll find the explanation for all of them. Probably the ones that are more evident to you now are tension and compression. We're going to see that shear is also extremely important in subsurface applications. Shear is the process behind uh, the formation of faults, the reactivation of fractures and faults, and we're going to see that it's extremely important for energy subsurface applications.